questions do you have for our experts? Um, they're going to take some time to introduce themselves and uh, they're then going to take some time to answer some questions. So we'd like you to do two things. The first one is, what do you know by now, right? What have you learned throughout the week? And the second part to this is, what do you still wonder about? So it's a no wonder activity, okay? Yes, Donna Lynn. I just wanna point out that we have a few of those experts in the room that will be on that expert panel this afternoon. So for Belinda and Robert, for example, um, this isn't a time to answer those questions in advance. This is a good time to say, what else do you wonder about? Or what are the things that you wish you could ask your colleagues on that panel as well? Um, yeah, okay, go ahead. Great point. Thanks, Alan. Um, okay, so we will uh, put you in groups. Uh, I just want to check in with Malachi. Are we all set with those groups? Jocelyn, is it okay if I add one more bit to TRIO listening? Sure, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So this tends to work best when you actually alternate speakers. So for example, if it was Belinda, Charles, and Matthew, if Belinda gives hers for five minutes and she talks, and you listen to Belinda as she's talking. And then it rotates and Matthew talks for a few minutes until he's done talking. And then that way every voice is heard and represented in the room. And then you open it up for general discussion. So that's kind of the trio listening. So we'll send a note every five minutes just to be like, hey, if you're still talking, maybe you should let somebody else talk. Um, so I just wanted to kind of let you know what those prompts would mean as they're coming through. Great, thanks, Donalyn. We are uh, good to go. Awesome, so we will whisk you away into your groups and we will send you a prompt in about five or six minutes or so. All right, see you in a bit. And away they go. Okay, so for our people who were in our breakouts, did you have a good conversation? Yes, I love that. Thank you for coming to our social activities. I love it. Um, as we are bringing people back um, to the main session today and as people are kind of joining us after lunch, um, a little bit about what we just did that I think will be helpful when we move into the expert panel in that piece. So in our social activity today, we kind of riffed off of Rob a little bit and tweaked our process slightly and said, you know, we kind of want to do, and Jocelyn had a great idea to say, maybe we can do an activity around I know and I wonder, which is something that we do, like a no wonder. And so we said, you know, what's something that you learned over the course of this workshop this week? And then what's something that you still wonder about? Because we're moving into a really awesome opportunity right now where we're going to spotlight a group of experts and ask the questions. What are still those big questions that you have that were left unexplored for you? Or maybe you just thought of them in the last session. Um, so we'd like to, to move into an expert panel. And what that's going to look like is we're going to spotlight all of, our, all of our experts. And we're also going to spotlight Dave and Elizabeth. Just a reminder, you guys get to moderate this session. Um, and we are going to invite you to leave questions in KaiStorm on our expert panel page. So you can kind of see who our experts are. Um, and this is a time for just interaction with them. Um, we're going to start by, as we spotlight them all, just asking you to kind of briefly introduce yourself. You'll recognize all of the faces because they have been with us throughout the week. So that's awesome. We've got to kind of get to know them a little bit in the room before we get started. Darn it, he spotlighted me again. Um, he's really good at it. Um, so I think with that, Dave, maybe we can kick it over to you to talk a little bit about the expert panel as we are spotlighting everyone and we'll Get sure, going. Donna Lynn. I just want to emphasize that all questions are allowed. Anything you want to ask these guys, they're here giving their time to give you whatever you need. So don't hesitate. Don't be shy, please. Um, in the past meetings, this has been a very popular session. And usually one question gets 
follows another and maybe five or six of the panelists want to answer it and that's a great dynamic. I'll point out that we have six, our six expert computational modelers and two biologists who have published modeling papers. So um, they will introduce themselves. We're going to take some time for them to go around and say a bit about themselves. I'd like you guys, when you introduce yourself to, just so we can get to know you a little better, um, name your favorite quantum phase or your, or your favorite fish, if you prefer. Quantum phase or fish. What if it's, what if it's a mammal, a marine mammal? Is that allowed? Uh, um, that is allowed, Carlos, for you. And I meant okay. to say field, not phase, by the way. Quantum field. You should be able to come up with that. All right, so, um, so I'm just gonna start it off by looking at my screen and call on Andrew. And when you're done, Andrew, call on the next person on your screen. Sure. I was trying to think of some fish that, uh, you know, rhymed with bosons or something, but uh, <clears throat> since I have a three-year-old, we have this puzzle with all kinds of different fish in there. I don't know the name of this one, but it's got the little headlight that comes down like an antenna. An uh, angler fish. What is it? An angler fish. Angler. angler fish. Yeah, I got to go with the angler fish. I mean, that's a triumph of evolution. So um, my name is Andrew Mugler. I am an assistant professor in the physics department at the University of Pittsburgh. And uh, I am a modeler or in physics as we call it a theorist. And um, most of what I think about is um, how cells interact and communicate and how that leads to emergent behaviors like differentiation in development or migration among bacteria or in tumors and things like this. Uh, but I also do some thinking about uh, sensing, how precisely cells can sense and how that's limited by very basic laws of physics. Um, and a lot of these questions I end up uh, working on with collaborators and that's a big way that I get um, inspired in new directions. And I've been lucky enough to have very good collaborations where I get in at the beginning and we speak the same language and so forth. So I'm, uh, I'm happy to share my experiences and I've enjoyed the workshop so far. Um, on my screen, the next person is Belinda. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Belinda Akpa, I'm a senior staff scientist at Oak Ridge National Laboratory and joint associate professor at the University of Tennessee in chemical and biomolecular engineering. So I'm a chemical engineer by training and not originally trained as a computational scientist or a biologist. Um, now I work in computational systems biology. And because I started my research life doing experiments, when I think about models, I often think about them in the context of how do I make the most sense out of what limited data I do have? And how do I figure out what the next thing is that I should measure and how best to, to go about measuring it? Um, I've worked on a wide range of different types of biological systems and I enjoy figuring out why things happen the way they do. And then as an engineer, always thinking about how we can intervene to make them do what we want them to do. Favorite fish, I uh, don't know how to answer that, but I come from a part of the world where we eat a lot of fish and whole fish is our preference. So I'll go with whole tilapia as my favorite fish to consume. Uh, pass it on to Carlos. Thank you. So my name is Carlos Lopez. Uh, I'm an associate professor of biochemistry at Vanderbilt University. And uh, my lab works on really understanding everything networks, network dynamics, network mechanisms, how information flows in networks, the relationship of, of data to network models. And so we're very interested in understanding complex systems, uh, both from a theory side and from a modeling side. So what can, can we develop new theories using models that explain or predict behaviors in complex systems? And uh, right now we, we focus on, on cell processes uh, at the molecular level or at the cell population level. Um, but you know, we, I believe that many of our things could be expanded to, to other areas as well. And now as far as favorite, I was gonna say my favorite uh, marine mammal is an orca, but since, he, since David said fish, it would probably be a shark, probably a hammerhead shark. They, they can sense things. They can sense your heartbeat. And I think that's pretty cool. So, you know. Uh, 
or the bobbit worm. They're pretty nasty. So, you know, and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> and I think the next person I'll call is, um, uh, I guess, Eric. Yes, hello, I'm Eric Deeds. I am an uh, associate professor in integrative biology and integrative biology and physiology at UCLA. Uh, my background is, is maybe biophysics. Um, I was, uh, as a graduate student, I worked on uh, uh, using lattice polymer models to understand protein folding and the evolution of protein structure, um, also uh, protein interaction networks. And um, uh, so that's my background a little bit. Um, I uh, uh, now my lab studies a number of things. One of the things we're interested in is using um, a combination of models and experiment um, to understand theoretically how uh, macromolecular machines self-assemble inside the cell, um, the kinds of dynamical uh, uh, problems they have, and uh, the ways that they've evolved to overcome things like kinetic trapping. Um, and uh, 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 the other interest that the lab has is, as we've heard from Andrew and Carlos and, and others here, um, in studying uh, 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 the dynamics of networks within cells, cell-cell communication. In particular, um, I've become fairly convinced that um, uh, uh, right now, uh, there's a lot of things in experimental data that we see that um, don't fit with my intuition of how uh, these types of systems should behave, say, gene regulatory networks. And so we're, we're working on that. Uh, we've been working a lot on um, analyzing single cell RNA sequencing data, for instance, and trying to understand better the structure of that data so that eventually um, we can uh, think about uh, how very, very large gene regulatory networks might behave uh, dynamically and the kinds of structures they might produce. So that's what we're interested in. And um, uh, with that, I'll pop it over to uh, Elizabeth, Liz. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Reed. Um, I'm assistant professor in chemical and biomolecular engineering at UC Irvine. Um, uh, there actually aren't that many of us in chemical engineering departments <laughs> like Belinda and me, but don't get the impression that there are, but there are a few. Um, and uh, so my group uh, studies uh, various stochastic processes in the cell. We focus a little bit on sort of the tool side on, on simulation algorithms for you know, stochastic biochemical systems, but um, we also um, have some collaborative projects in gene regulation and epigenomics and are really excited by, by um, you know, so the, the possibilities of sort of mo mechanistic models guiding analysis of big data. Um, my favorite fish, I'll go with the salmon because sometimes I think that, you know, being in an interdisciplinary field is like having to jump up waterfalls. <laughs> I forgot, I forgot my fish, by the way. I have to yeah. say the fish. Only I'm going to choose field because who can't like the, the Higgs field? has a non-zero value everywhere in space. I mean, <laughs> come on, it's a cool field. Um, in terms of fish, um, we, got, we got to go with the cod. And the reason I chose the cod is that when my daughter was very young, we listened to this book while we were driving somewhere and the guy starts saying, the cod is an ugly fish. And it's so true, but it's a very tasty fish. So there you go. I did field and fish. <laughs> nice. Okay, I'll pass it to Robert. You're muted, Robert. My name is Rob Arkowitz. I'm a research professor in the south of France at the University of Nice, Côte d'Azur. Uh, my background is and training is as a biochemist, chemist biochemist. And since uh, starting my lab, I've been doing more cell biology. Uh, we're very interested in trying to understand how cells become asymmetric, both with respect to shape, but also with respect to internal components. We're also interested in how membrane traffic uh, contributes to cell growth, how growth is initiated and how it's maintained over time. We work on fungi, cell shape and fungi. And we also work quite a lot with modelers and this is uh, quite a lot of mathematical modeling of asymmetries, but we also work with physical models. For example, we're interested in how cells can grow into solid substrates. And there we work with modelers to generate very simple, basic physical models that we can then use to ask questions about the growth process that we study. Uh, let's see, what else? Did I, so with respect to fish, I'd have to say probably the scorpion fish. And the reason is that I think it's both a very beautiful fish, but also a very ugly fish. And I think it, covering those two domains, I think is actually quite important. The beauty of the aesthetics, but also the ugly part, which I think is also critical. And I pass it on to John. Hi. I, I, I... Apologize for being late first. Uh, uh, I'm 
John Cooper. I'm in the biochemistry and cell biology departments at Washu Medical School. Uh, uh, I study the cellular skeleton and cell motility, both at a level of biochemistry with, with pure proteins. And as a graduate student, I wrote kinetic models for actin polymerization. And, and then, uh, but then I, I've been primarily a cell biologist and uh, I, I've always appreciated modeling both in, for cells and for molecules. And so my, uh, I've had been uh, really enjoyed being able to collaborate with a number of really great modelers along the way. One of them was Anders Carlson, who we, who we heard mentioned earl, earlier on today. I mean, yet the other day, uh, who writes, you know, physical models for how actin filaments and other cytoskeletal molecules might produce force and movement within the, the cell. And this has been really great because uh, I can pose questions and get him to help me with the mathematics and the computational stuff. And then he has ideas that come to him from his, from what he's looking at. And he'll have ideas for experiments and we'll, we're always happy to do them. So we've had a really fruitful uh, collaboration. So, I'm sorry, I should toss it to- Favorite fish. Yeah. Fish. Oh, I'm sorry. My fish. My fish is a uh, rainbow trout. I mean, I've been in the Colorado Rockies when I've been escaping from the pandemic, and they have rainbow trout there. So, um, that was my supermodel, the Zoolander. That's everyone, right? That we have. And Carlos, what are you doing? We're trying to show a picture of Derek Zoolander as a supermodel because we're all modelers. We're all supermodelers. Okay. So. Well, I, I, I enjoyed those introductions. I have to say I'm a little disappointed, and I'm sure Rob Phillips is as well, that only one quantum field was named. But we're going to move on to the, I'm going to just take these questions in order that they were posted. So the very first question, and panelists, please feel free to just jump in. Um, whoever wants to answer, answer. And it's certainly fine for multiple answers. You can take turns. What are the differences in the way computational scientists and biologists think? What, in your opinion, are the biggest obstacles to their communication? Do you think they speak different languages? Is there any, anything universities can do with regard to education to encourage interdisciplinary um, and overcome the language interdisciplinarity and overcome the language barrier. So there's a lot of questions in there, but they're all speaking to the um, lack of communication between um, computational scientists and biologists. Who wants to take that one? So one thing I'd like to just point out is that I'd, I, every person in front of us here spends all of their time thinking about biological systems. So why shouldn't we call them biologists too? Is I think at some point, Part of this question presupposes that if one uses computational frameworks or mathematical frameworks to study the world, that so for physicists, we don't think there and say, well, Rob, because Rob uses math, that he's any less a physicist than anyone who uses an experimental system to study, to study the, the systems in question. And I think this is part of where the problem lies, um, actually, uh, uh, a little bit. I don't mean to be too aggressive with that. I know it's a common way to pose the problem, but it's kind of weird that people who spend all of their time thinking about biological systems might not be called biologists. But uh, it is true that many people may not have their training, their background. They may not have like a history in biology, right? They may have come to it late, like many of us sort of discovered it later in our lives that that was where sort of the really interesting questions lie in our you know, opinion, so. Yeah, I mean, people have different backgrounds, but if you're going to make progress in biological systems, I think you have to at least know something about biology, um, right? Like, I mean, uh, uh, anyway, I, don't, I, I understand where the question was coming from, but I just wanted to highlight that the way that we're talking about it seems to actually sort of create the notion that there has to be a divide and okay. that it's gotta be a tough one um, before we even go forward. But anyway, I'll stop talking. What? Okay, so let me just jump in. I'm. I appreciate that vision 
Eric. I think that's a vision of a time in the future when we can all come together and love one another. Um, but I, I think the question is reflecting a reality that is with us today, which is people that are trained in different disciplines do have different approaches to problems and ways of thinking about problems and languages that are not necessarily easily understood um, by the people in other disciplines. And, and I, there have been many essays written about this, so that must mean it's true, right? Um, so I'm gonna let others. So I, I wanted to follow up on that because you introduced what I was gonna say uh, very well. Thank you, David. We didn't plan this. I think the difference is not necessarily in language, but in, in shared uh, paradigms. So for example, a physicist and an engineer can all agree that, you know, I don't know, fluids follow a certain law of diffusion, or, you know, if they design an airplane, they can agree that lift comes from one source or another. I think the challenge when, it, when you go from a quantitative field like, you know, biology, uh, sorry, physics or chemistry or whatever, uh, to a field like biology is more in the knowledge and the data and the disparity that comes between the two. Because what joins the data and the knowledge is modeling. Whether, whether you call it uh, complicated ODE modeling or network modeling or data-driven modeling, or if it's just a simple fit to a bunch of data points, it's still a model. And I think the challenge is more, what did we measure and what, what knowledge do we want? And then what technique do we use to connect those two? And so the language difference is a more, for me at least, about you know, measuring, doing a Western blot, and then deriving a mechanism, which is a bunch of cartoons with arrows and calling that a model versus, you know, someone like, I don't know, like me or like Eric, where we actually write a bunch of equations and call that a model. And it's not that we're, we're trying to talk about the same thing, but from different uh, kind of perspectives. And I think that we don't, well, in biology, at least we don't have a unifying foundation, theoretical foundation to bring these things together. And I think that that's more the, what we're looking for. I, finding the common language. And that to me is the, the, the kind of the gap and the, the, the difference, you know. Uh, I don't think that I am better or someone else is better. I think it's just we're, we don't speak the same language in terms of how to interpret the data. Because the data is the data. So in the question is asking, what can be done with that, about that? Can universities educate better in it? Um, cross-disciplinary thinking? Well, let me just jump in there. So what I, one of the things I do at UCLA is I run this huge class where we teach freshmen. We have thousands of them, so we can't take them to the Galapagos or whatever because it's a state school. So, you know, we have thousands of kids and we try to do our best, you know. Um, but the point is that we don't teach them the standard version of calculus that everyone learns. We teach them dynamical systems theory. Um, and at least that gives them the language of what is a system of ordinary differential equations. Right, like, like they know what that is. In fact, they know that um, such a thing is a map between a state space and the cross section of the tangent bundle of the manifold of the solutions that we call the vector field. So they know what that what I just said means, actually, at least some of it. So they they are they're learning that. So universities can start to try to educate young biologists, regardless of whether they want to spend most of their time doing experiments or most of their time being a doctor or most of their time you know, doing whatever, um, we can educate them in some of the quantitative language that we use. And that's one way to help in the future, whether it helps, I mean, obviously it's not helping now, but, but that's one thing that, that we're doing at UCLA. And I, I think it's a really cool model uh, for, for how you can sort of uh, 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 start to kind of Kind of make sure that everyone's on the same page because when you say system of ordinary differential equations that might sound very scary or weird or whatever i don't know idea what that is jargon but really all it is as rob pointed out this morning is a statement of how things change what's the update rule how's stuff changing and and when students learn that they're like no longer is that mystical and so when they see a talk or read a paper that uses odes they're like oh cool i got that you know so that can anyway so um, Wallace Marshall has put something into the chat where he points out that people are considered biologists, whether their training is in physics or chemistry, based on what experiments they're doing. If they're studying a biological system, they're biologists. And he points out that um, biochemists used to be viewed as biologists. So you know these names, I think, are obviously somewhat arbitrary 
But what I want to note is when in the course of my career, we've gone from cell biology to quantitative cell biology. If you're not doing quantitative cell biology now, you're not doing anything. So obviously within our short lifetimes, there's an evolution in the science. And it's like just now that biology is really beginning to embrace, hopefully modeling in a serious way, it's kind of us to, up to us to help negotiate that. But I think that's what this is all about. Um, maybe if everyone or, or offered a course like Eric's, that would help. Any other thoughts on this question? The disconnect between fields? I was just going to, oh, sorry, go ahead, Belinda. No, you haven't spoken yet, go ahead. I was just going to say that I think it's useful just for um, students to be aware that they are swimming in the milieu of a particular discipline that has a certain set of norms and that other norms exist. You don't necessarily need to know the language of another field, but starting from a point where you're aware that there are other languages is already, I think, moving things in a direction where you can begin to foster the kinds of interactions that we need to foster for this kind of science to, to go forward. And so one thing that struck me when I started working with biologists is that when we build a model, we immediately start making assumptions and simplifications and playing with abstractions. And that idea that I would assume anything made my biological collaborators very uncomfortable. If they saw something in a model that they hadn't seen in an experiment, they'd say, well, you can't say that. Versus a sophomore chemical engineer, the first thing that they're learning in their process um, systems classes is, how to diagram a system, make appropriate assumptions and justify those assumptions. That's just our norm. And then you can test the implications of assumptions by testing them against experimental data. And we've had seen lots of presentations this week where you try a model, you predict something, you see if the experiment bears it out. Um, so just, I think being aware of the system in which you are operating in terms of the languages that you use and the norms of your discipline and that there are other norms and that there are relative merits in different situations to taking different approaches already sets the scene for being able to collaborate effectively. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I like that point, Belinda. Anyone else wanna chime in on this question? Should we move to the next one? Okay, so the next I think, question. I think Liz had something to say, Liz. Oh, no, we, we can move. I was just gonna say that uh, even within these categories, there's there's inability to communicate. So for example, you know, people who would be considered <laughs> computationalists, whatever, um, could be very different if you're a data-driven modeler versus a hypothesis-driven modeler, and et cetera. You might have a hard time communicating with each other. <laughs> All righty, so the next question. If you could go to sleep like Rip Van Winkle for 50 years and come back and talk to a panel like this, what would you like to know about what had been achieved in our understanding of the living world? Did you write the question, David? Say again? Should I want me did to you read it again? No, no, I did not write the question. Oh That's yeah, funny. I think you did. Yeah, yeah I think you did. I think <laughs> that someone inspired by Rob Phillips' talk wrote the question. I did not write the question. <laughs> uh, I, would, I would like to know that the living world still exists <laughs> and has not burned up the planet <laughs> from the global warming. I'll settle for that. But but seriously, I, I actually seriously think that like biological research is going to all be all about global warming or won't even exist. Be at, be at the expense of research into atmospherics and whatever else one can do. Okay, well, on that note, let's adjourn the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> no, look guys, the, the, we're not getting even close to the, to the optimum that was in the, 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 the like what, like 40,000 years or four, four, 40 million years ago, right? So, you know, within the next, we got at least two centuries people, I would say. But beyond okay. that, you know, you got a point. But Wait, Eric, you know. Eric, hold on a second. As moderator, I'm going to take out my moderator gavel and say, although I share John's cynicism, pessimism, and despair, um, we're not here to talk about climate change. So let's pretend that the world is going to go on for 50 years and address the question, which is really 
what do you hope biologists and physicists and chemists, all of us together, will find out about living systems in the next 50 years? Um, we'll just pretend that we are going to continue to exist as human civilization for 50 more years. It's a thought question. I mean, thought experiment. Anyone? Okay. I would say prediction of behavior, prediction of, of organism, cell, molecule behavior, how to put it in a broad sense. So basically um, getting the predictability that chemists and physicists have in biology. Across scales. Yeah. Do you think that's possible? Some of it is. Um. Well, let me, I, let, let me follow up my question of this, is that possible by, by saying that I, I was um, saying to Rob in the green room, Rob Phillips, that you know, we, we do do a lot of uh, phenomenological modeling in biology. It's just not formalized. So I think all of medicine, human medicine, is phenomenologically modeled. Um, but the problem to formalize it is that there is such variability of individuals, how could you ever write an equation that will predict how a given person would respond to a given medication given all that variability? So when we look at a physical system, a pure cube of some element, a pure element, and then we expose it to some stimulus or manipulation, the number of variables are many fewer and maybe we can get to, well, obviously we have gotten to very strong predictive models. But now if you wanna talk about a human population responding to um, a particular medication, there's just so many more variables. So I wonder if we can reach that degree of predictability. I'm just thinking out loud here. Well, I, th I mean, I think people in medicine would say that precision medicine is going to do exactly that, that everyone will have their genome sequenced as soon as they're born. And then uh, there will be predictions about what therapy will be the best for whatever disease you happen to get today. The other, the other thing I was going to say was that uh, my daughter models infections moving through human populations. So even though, no, we can't make an accurate prediction for what this one person is going to experience, we do have a really good sense of what the population of like Southwest Missouri is going to experience, whether they like it or not. <laughs> All right. So does anybody else want to pretend it's 50 years from now we still exist and you can ask the panel anything about biology? What, what's the thing you'd really want to know? Come on, this is the Rob Phillips, I wonder exercise. You really ought to be able to come up with what you would want to know. Carlos? You're lit up. Oh, no, it's an extremely good think? question. It's an extremely good question, Rob. I'm not talking because I always talk and I'm working on myself. Okay, Carlos, you, you seemed ready to say something and then you stopped. No, I just, uh, I just think that, um, I don't know. I, I honestly have to think about it more because- okay. I'll give my answer. Cognition, memory and cognition. We know pretty much nothing, very sure. close to nothing. Consciousness, cognition, the neurosciences, memory. Um, we know a little, not much. Sometimes when I talk to genetics undergraduate students about DNA and genetics and stuff we know so well, I try to get them to imagine the original experimenters not knowing. And I say, right now, we don't know anything about how memories are really in, you know, coded in our brains and maybe in 50 years we will. And students will have a hard time imagining how we never, we didn't know that once. In the meantime, unless someone speaks up right By now- By the way, that's the other thing that might obliterate us in less than 50 years is, is AI overtaking human <laughs> right. cognition. Yeah, Stephen Hawking's prediction actually. Um, unless anyone has something to say right now, I'm I, gonna I tell do. the questioner that no, this do. panel of experts cannot think of a single thing they'd no. ask in 50 years. No, no, I, yeah, it's, it, there's lots of things. I mean, 
One of the things that I would love to know is have you all up in the future figured out how to really interface with highly dimensional, with high dimensional structures and data? Because so for instance, we're developing this incredible ability to measure what you might call cellular state in unbelievably high dimensional vector spaces. And our intuition is to always PCA then TISNY so we can look at it in 2D. And a lot of our notions about topology and how we quantify that with like simplices and stuff all work in like four or five dimensions, but in 20,000 dimensions, we got really nothing. And this goes for data and for dynamical systems because the, the actual dynamical system that even in a coarse grain model, like I'm not talking about the level of atoms, I'm talking at the level of say gene gene interactions in a gene regulatory network. It's also a very high dimensional uh, dynamical system. And we don't actually know a ton theoretically about that. So those would be questions that I would ask them is like how, because I don't know, I haven't been able to figure anything out yet. So I'm, I would want that. I would want them to tell me how they figured out how to think about that. And, and then, and then I, would, I, would, I would be really excited by learning how these much smarter people figured out what to do compared to me. Um, that's one question. I could keep going, but I don't want to take the spotlight. No, I'm, I'm telling this questioner that um, this panel can't think of a decent question to ask in 50 years. That's our final answer. Oh, thanks, right. for, your, uh, thanks for your editorial comment on my question. No, Brian. no, you're, OK. Yours is accepted. You had an answer. You had. An Isn't answer. that also discounting Rob's question, which was, which was what I was also thinking was like, will we be able to really predict a cell's behavior, like really yeah. have a multi-scale oh, okay. model that can actually, you know, deal with the complexity that right now is so daunting, um, and be able to to really have these predictive models? And I wonder, is the state space just too huge, or are we actually going to be able to get there in fifty years by a combination of fancy computational techniques and better experiments? I would ask them, have we done something where we didn't just to replace a system in the real world that we don't understand with a system on the computer that we also do not understand, <laughs> regardless of its predictive ability, right? Okay. Like if I'm it gonna... makes good predictions, and I'm not just talking about machine learning models, I'm talking about like... Yeah, that's what models. I meant. Yeah, like a mechanistic, like we have the thing, you know, we understand every all right, all interaction. Right. I am changing my scorecard on appeal. Rob Arkowitz. Eric Deeds, Elizabeth Reed, you all get credit for posing a question. Uh, I want to move on, though, because I feel like we're not really pushing the boundaries of wonder here. Um, the next question is, do you think that big data and machine learning are going to truly and fundamentally change how we think about the world? After machine learning is done, do you think it is important to turn in to turn to in turn figure out an intuitive description of the underlying phenomena. So we've got big data, we've got machine learning, and after that's all done, this person wants to know: Will we have advanced our intuitive understanding of the underlying phenomena? I think it's kind of getting to what you guys were just saying, in, in a sense. Anybody want to take that one? Are we really going to understand the world better from big data? That's what they're asking. I think that, uh, I think that, um, yes. So I think that, I don't know if it's necessarily that big data is going to change things, but I think it's going to change our paradigm. So I think that in the, what was it, 50s or 60s, uh, we started to, to embrace the hypothesis driven paradigm of research. And that hypothesis-driven paradigm has been very helpful in many ways. And, you know, you have to go back to people like Karl Popper. And I, I encourage everyone to read Karl Popper's, uh, you know, um, views on science and why the scientific method is the way to go. But it's not the only one. And there's many ways to do it. And I think that what big data is doing is opening doors for us to do data-driven research. Rather than being motivated by does this happen or does not happen, let's measure something and then discover things from this data set. Uh, or for example, uh, uh, things that come to mind are, you know, uh, in physics, for example, in astronomy, you cannot go and make an experiment and move Saturn and Jupiter and the sun. You just measure things and you infer knowledge from that data. And uh, I think in biology, we're so focused on the hypothesis and the test that we're losing a lot of opportunity for discovery of new laws and new new uh, uh, theorems 
because we're so wed to this idea of making the model, making observation, making the model, testing the model. There's other ways to do science, and this is just one of them. So I think that big data is opening the doors for that. I would also say I think there's sort of two types of big data, right? There's <clears throat> the the type where you don't care about intuition and you just want predictive power. You don't care how it comes, and maybe that it's like you know the profit driven viewpoint or something. But then there's I think there, are, you know, I've seen really interesting examples of using tools from machine learning to try to learn models, and and putting penalties on the complexity of those models. So it's almost like instead of using machine learning to predict, you're using machine learning to help you think. And that's that's an entirely different like philosophy of how to teach yourself something from the data, because the goal is not necessarily to predict, it's to you know, aid in your, in your uh, distillation or simplification of what you're seeing. So to me, you know, having grown up with a premium on simplicity, I want nothing to do with the first type, but I'm, I am curious about whether computers can help me think clearer. So I think there, there's a, a split here between the value of having a predictive model, which obviously is extremely important in our world, but also the value of having a model that helps us understand the natural world. And maybe sometimes you have both, but I think, I think that you can have two separate categories. And what this question is about is the latter, understanding nature. And I think what Carlos is arguing and um, Andrew, maybe if I'm not misreading you the same, that um, big data's predictive power is valuable. And there's, that's not, not something that's questionable. But I think the question is asking, will it help us understand nature? And which is something that some few of us care about. <laughs> I mean, I guess a very few. No, I'm not saying you guys, but I mean, the world at large doesn't really care that much about it, but um, I hope basic scientists do. So what do you think, if we re-emphasize re that point, Carlos, do you think, do you see big data and AI helping us get to the fundamentals? I think they will give us, um, so I think that big data and AI are gonna find I mean, they already do, right? They already help us find correlations or, or, or things that were not obvious by just looking at the data. But it's still going to be up to the modelers uh, and to people, to scientists, to find you know, mechanistic interactions. If we're ever going to come up with a predictive understanding of biology, um, I mean, I always, I always say, you know, yes, you have a sperm and an egg and out comes a human. Why is it not a, a dog or a cat or a PlayStation? Uh, I would like a PlayStation sometimes because my kids are really crazy. But but we know that the, the rules, somehow the system always gives you the same outcome on average. And um, we don't know what those rules are. And I think the machine learning and AI and things like that are gonna give us those connections that we don't, we don't quite see yet that might open the doors to you know, novel theories. So um, I think what you're saying, it's an important tool. Belinda, were you lighting up? I, pretty much what you just said, David. I mean, I see it as a tool. All of these things are tools. The experiments are tools. The models are tools. You know, everything has its strengths and limitations, and you have to assess within context what is the best approach given your objective. And so I, I don't think any one thing is the magic cure-all. Um, there are times when you need to be predictive and maybe interpretability is not that important. There are times when you will never have enough data um, to be able to just use one of these data-driven approaches to move forward. Ideally, you want to find ways to integrate all these different ways of knowing and actually the machine learning uh, and deep learning approaches can be helpful in doing that kind of integration and driving forward the, the explainable um, solution. So it's all good stuff. More useful tools, the better. It makes me wonder what it means to have understanding, you know, like if we have, we're able to discover, you know, this complicated circuit diagram, for example, 
Is that the understanding or is the understanding that we're able to distill it down further and understand sort of the key component or the key sort of dynamical aspect of this that makes it work? And that, that is that understanding because then you can apply it to a different system. You can invent something new. You can predict how it behaves in a completely different situation. Like what is, I almost feel like there's like understanding is inherently simplifying. Like it has to become human readable. And that's also a problem, right? Because we limit ourselves because our brains can only handle sort of a certain complexity of, you know, it's like the picture that we want, we really want to be able to distill it down to that. And are there areas where that's just not possible and we just have to be a computer brain <laughs> to be able to actually understand it? Well, I think the gold standard is to find the unifying principles to, to understand, um, just distill out the simplicity of nature. And that's, that's where when biologists, I mean, here's a thing about biologists and physicists that I do think is a disconnect. I will talk now to computational scientists as a biologist. Engineers always end with a product that was designed rationally, logically, and every component fit together for a reason. But biological systems were not designed that way. And they end up the way they are, not as the best solution in many cases, but just as a good enough solution at a certain point in evolutionary time. So that's a really important thing, I think, for the um, physical scientists to understand that it's messy and complicated in biology. Yeah, I'll, I'll offer a quick quick uh, meditation on this. So if you think about it, how is we as biologists, how do we get most of our work funded? So here we're in an NSF workshop, but you know the vast majority of of, of, of biology research is, is funded by that other institution that shall not be named. Yeah. And that other institution, and we as biologists really, through the history of biology, have kind of sold this thing, especially in the last 30 years, in a practical sense. Like, we're gonna make you not sick, people. And you don't wanna die, and you don't want your loved ones to die. So we're gonna do that, and we're gonna make it so that you people don't die. And so then what everybody wants is stuff that in the near future is gonna make people not die. And you don't care if there's a black box that's sitting on top of some data and makes someone not die. You don't care anything, it's just practical. And what we don't have is that kind of Carl Sagan, kind of like the love of understanding for its own sake, because it's important. I don't care if it actually helps you engineer a cell to do something like go to Mars and, and build a party dome or whatever. I, I don't care. I, I wanna understand this thing because understanding is beautiful and understanding is meaningful. It's completely divorced of its, of its practical imports. And I feel like we as a field, the physicists got them people to build a $9 billion instrument to find that Higgs thing I said, right? which has yes. absolutely no practical import so whatsoever. As I, far absolutely, as anyone knows. I, I agree but, absolutely. But we can't be, we're always like, so that's why, you know what, you, how much easier it is it going to be for y'all to get funding to do machine learning to predict cancer phenotypes versus anything that has to do with understanding. Just think so about that. I agree with what you're saying, Eric, but I would say it wasn't always that way. When I was- I agree. When I was a kid, there was an understanding that understanding nature was valuable in itself. And Richard Feynman wrote some beautiful essays about this. If you've never read them, read those. Um, no, the, I, think, I did read them. And I think, but let me just say, I agree that it used to be this way, but it isn't now. I like what Wallace just said. You say this now, Eric, but once someone builds a Higgs boson bomb, you will sing a different tune. <laughs> Can, and now that you've mentioned, um, we've got a lot of chat here. And I would invite people who are writing their thoughts to jump in. That's perfectly fine. We've got Rob is out there and Wallace, the babe is out there chatting. I can't read all these chats and listen to the speakers. So please feel free to jump in verbally. Unmute yourself, barge in. I'm gonna go on to the next question. Um, how can we better understand quantitatively the connection between evolution interstellar dynamics and the dynamic the dynamics of population slash ecosystems okay very trivial question that should be easy to answer should i read it again it's 42 uh, that that would be my answer good one carlos i hope you all got that 
not. <laughs> Carlos will explain it in the chat. So we want to, the person wants to know how we can quantitatively um, connect evolution, intracellular dynamics, and the dynamics of population and ecosystems. I would say this is, I think, in part at least, the goal that Rob Phillips was talking about in his talk was to find unifying principles, things that seem very different, even at very different scales. I think he mentioned a, I don't know, 10 to the sixth difference in scale, but actually are operating on the same principles. That's the goal. So the question is how? And Carlos has said 42. I've said, <laughs> I don't have any idea. Anybody else? Okay, you stumped the panel. No, I, get... but I talk all the time, David, but I'll say one thing <laughs> that, that, that if you can explain why something has the shape that it does, that's, you know, from the standpoint of an evolutionary understanding, like maybe I'm, I'm, I'm like really a super selectionist, so you have to forgive me. But I think that if you've got a system in front of you that you can sort of explain why it has the shape that it does and, and maybe understand a little bit the evolutionary pressures that have given it that shape, then that, that, can, be, that, can, that can go towards what you're talking about. I think a long-term synthesis would be awesome. I think we'd have to go to sleep for longer than 50 years to achieve that. But, but certainly, certainly in the short term, I think that's something that, that you can do is, is try to understand you know, why might have systems evolved to have these properties, not purely because they're not necessarily optimal, but what, 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 what have been the evolutionary pressures that have, have applied to give this system the structure it has and not some other structure. Okay, we've got 10 more minutes, two more questions, and then one I wanna pose on behalf of a student. So the next question is, how do we facilitate the transfer of modeling approaches between different fields of biology and science? How do we facilitate the transfer? What, what um, do you mean by the transfer? I don't know, I'm just reading the question. I think the question is asking how do we get better communication between? Inter so, yeah, go ahead. So I think that, um, so if I understand it, this is the way that I understand the question is, how do we facilitate the transfer of say, for example, engineering to biology or, or you know, physics to biology? Uh, I think that actually that is what we have tried for the last like 50 years and it's gotten us nowhere. I think that we need new tools and new approaches and, you know, a cell is not a circuit, a cell is not a control system, a cell is a cell and, you know, whether we want to or not, we have to deal with the complexity of it. And um, and it's a system that, um, yes, we can understand one reaction, but understanding millions of reactions happening at the same time for each cell is gonna be very challenging. So I think that um, what I have learned in the last, you know, my young 20 years of research is that cells, uh, you know, that all these tools that we're using are are not ideal and they're, and we're limited by the resolution of the data and we're limited by many things to make it better. So you're not um, offering any sort of hope for this questioner? Uh, well, Belinda. no, I'm saying, I'm saying don't transfer, invent. <laughs> we need new tools. Belinda or Elizabeth, do you have a, um, more hope for this questioner? I mean, I'm not sure I entirely understand what they mean by transfer, but I will say that um, I think Elizabeth mentioned how as chemical engineers operating in this space, that we don't always have a community of people who are thinking about problems in this way. And that can limit sort of how we progress in terms of matching approaches between the different biological questions that we might be interested in. And so, for example, it was two years, three years previously at another FYIM where Elizabeth functioned as the expert modeler um, as I presented work with one of my biological collaborators. And I have to say, just having the opportunity to sit down and talk to her for a while, we, we, we study different biological questions, but we're both operating in a similar framework and asking 
similar classes of questions in terms of the analogies. And so that meant that we had this sort of cross fertilization, which we were able to take off with our project and eventually get it funded, building on some of the things that came out of our discussion. And I have reflected on how valuable it would be for me to walk down the hall and have a conversation like that with somebody like Elizabeth on a regular basis. And it's something that I know my biological lab uh, colleagues were able to do if they were working with an assay that wasn't behaving or something like that, they could just go and talk to somebody. And so just to have some way of facilitating that community when we are dispersed in all of our different physics, biology, medical school, whatever environments, but we are all people who think broadly about how to transfer different ways of thinking about problems like the, the fields that we heard about this morning having a space where we come together and get to delve into those conversations, I think would really help in terms of transferring between those of us who are doing this kind of work. It sounds like you're arguing for the value of this sort of meeting, that there Absolutely. should be, there should yeah. be more of these. And, and perhaps you're arguing that the organizers of these meetings shouldn't actually have to write their NSF renewal, but just be given the award because it's such a community service. I, th I think I, I heard that in there somewhere. Well, only, only if that award also goes to the, you know, uh, pa expert panel and, you know. <laughs> Elizabeth, did you want to follow up on what Belinda was saying or no? I mean, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. And I, yeah, I, I also have <laughs> good, good memories. I'm glad that, that it was productive for you. It was really productive for me too, to have those discussions. And I think that's also pointing to the fact that there's also it's not just about getting these two sides to talk to each other, you know, as if the sides exist, right? Biology and computation, but also just, you know, a transfer of ideas across, you know, different computational methods. And, and so, um, and it is challenging. Yeah, we are very interdisciplinary. We are dispersed in different uh, sort of departments and schools. And I think there is a role for, um, you know, research centers, at least at my university, research centers play, I think, a really important role in bridging yeah. the divides between the departments. Um, and they have all kinds of, you know, ways of encouraging people to collaborate across disciplines, even, you know, small amounts of money, tiny seed grants, like really like nothing, you know, but, you know, something where you can just encourage, you know, grad students to talk to each other that wouldn't necessarily talk to each other. Um, I think all those tools can be really useful um, for getting people to, to. Um... All right. So, um, I totally agree with that. I think those types of facilities, Carlos, I'm going to skip you. So okay. I think that what will eventually bring us closer and help us work together is not the techniques, um, but the, um, the questions. So for example, one of the things that I'm fascinated by is the fact that, you know, uh, as Eric was saying, you know, in medicine, um, uh, the, the toxicology people talk about cell death, the cancer people talk about cell death, the, the different, different people talk about the same topics, but they do it all in little separate islands. And I think that there's no unified knowledge base for basic processes like, like uh, you know, differentiation, like uh, cell death, like metabolism. And I think that, that um, different people are trying to do different things. And so when you look at, at biology as a whole, it's, it's, it's the proverbial, you know, blind men describing the elephant. The people that are looking at the toxicologist, I say, oh, no, you know, cell death looks like DNA damage. And the people that are doing cancer say, oh, no, no, cell death looks like, you know, something else. And I think that we're, we're lacking that unification. And I think it's meetings like this with organizers like David that actually are making us, you know, forcing us to speak closer and to, and to work together better. I think that we need more of this. Did you hear that, Matthew? Okay, last question. And then I want to pose one um, for the last minute on behalf of, of a graduate student. How to approach the challenge of parameter and model estimation slash uncertainty when the space of possible parameters and models is often huge? I think this is actually echoing something we heard in many of the project presentations. How did you go down this path? Why did you choose this approach? So um, so yeah. I will say that you should look at PiSB and PyDream that are from my lab that are specifically designed for that question. Um, I think that um, I think that understanding the data and understanding the information contained in the data is the first step. And uh, and if if whoever wrote the question, if uh, this is something we think about a lot in my lab, so if you're interested in at least our bad perspective on it, I'd be very happy to share. But I think, it, I think that we are in general, so I think that biology is much more like 
climate modeling and a lot less like physics or engineering in that we have a lot of uncertainty. Uh, we can, rather than giving you the mechanism, I could give you the 90% the mechanism that is true 90% of the time or 80% of the time, much like tracking a hurricane gives you that probability cone. Uh, if you lived in Florida or in the, or in the East, you'll, you've seen those. I think that um, we, we, don't, we cannot measure everything as hell. And all we do is we have partial knowledge. And with that partial knowledge comes conditional probability. And I think that that's the paradigm shift that we need to start thinking about models and data and certainty. So you're saying that you can help this person and direct them to an appropriate modeling approach by looking at the data and say, at okay. Least paradigm, at, least a, at least a paradigm that is not like, you know, the model, the vector of optimus solutions. You know, I think that we're, we have to acknowledge that there's uncertainty in pretty much everything we do. And right. uh, to date, our model does not make <clears throat> Anyone else want to answer this one? I think it, it's also worth pointing out that this question is often posed as if the data is, you know, like put there in front of us and we're, we're just interested in the best model for the data. But it, often it happens the other way around. We all come to science with <clears throat> our own like biases about what type of model we find interesting in our heads. I mean, even experimentalists do this. And that often defines what problems we find interesting. You know, I'm thinking of Rob's talk where he's proverbially sitting on the beach and watching the seals or whatever, watching a seal, you know, push into a sea of fish or something. Like he already is thinking about flocking, you know, from a young age or whatever and seeing the connections. And that might influence, you know, what, what data he's interested in. It's not, it doesn't always have to be uh, what model can I get for my data? It might be what data can I investigate with my worldview? <laughs> That's an interesting worldview. Um, Donalyn and Jocelyn, do we have like just one minute? We exactly have one minute. So I, okay, I'm going to throw this question out there and one person can answer, I guess. A graduate student in my department um, met with, did a meet a model. It was with Andrew and I asked him, how was it? He said, oh, it was great. And I said, well, what did you talk about? And he's like, I asked him about my career. So he's um, a developmental biologist working on zebrafish. Um, and he apparently asked Andrew what his next step should be, Andrew's advice. And I thought that would be a good question to pose to the, mo to the panel. Um, for someone in that position, what would you advise? But since this involves Andrew and we're almost out of time, Andrew, what'd you tell him? Wait. Can you say this again? <laughs> um, the student Srivatsan. He was. Oh told, yeah, yeah, yeah. He asked you what you know what you would suggest for his next step um, after his PhD as a developmental biologist. That's uh, a lot of imaging of zebrafish embryos, and he wanted your opinion of what would be the next good training step for him. I remember our conversation, but I don't know if he asked me this specifically. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I would say I, I always think, you know, what's an, what's that the best thing to do after a PhD is to find something that interests you equally, but is maximally different from, <laughs> from what you've done so that you can combine uh, different things to, that you've studied and also different, um, you know, ways you've been mentored to study it. I totally agree with that. I've given that advice many times. So we are totally out of time expert panel and we have only four or five minutes for any personal breaks before the town hall. So um, I, I hope you all will return for the town hall. I'm pitching this as an important thing and I personally have to take a comfort break but I'll be back in four minutes. I also want to just step in for the panel really quickly and just say thank you as well. Um, this is a great opportunity where early career people really get to listen in. And, that, and so thank you very much from, for taking the time out to, to do this for our community. It's really great. Thank you. And with that, I guess we get a short bio break for three minutes before we come back for the town hall. Thank you very much. Welcome back.
from the lightning restroom break time. And we are ready to turn this over to Dave and Elizabeth, the co-organizers of the actual event. Um, so with that, we will let you take over. I know you have a lot to talk about. A lot of a lot to talk about. Wow, that that expert question. And that am I muted? No, I'm good, right? You guys can hear me. You're great. You're yep. good. Uh, that panel question and answer really brought this point to uh, really clear that the community building this community. A lot of the questions had to do with that. How how do we bridge these gaps? How do we work together? Um, so. Let me just start by saying in this town hall, any and all comments are welcome. Any opinions, any suggestion, any feedback, any announcements, stories, jokes, songs, poems, anything that's on your mind, please feel free to bring that forward. But I wanna start by taking a few minutes to give you my thoughts about this meeting. I said at the outset, if you can remember back to Monday, that the mission for this grant, the Research Coordinated Network Grant, was by these three meetings and the website, which is really a dating website for um, scientists that Michael is developing, that it was to build a systems biology community. And I, I, I said, we're no longer meeting to serve cell biologists we're no longer bringing in computational people to hold our hands. This is about everyone. So of course, during the meeting, I'm asking myself, have we accomplished that in this meeting? And I would say the answer is largely no. And the, and that, the reason for that, I think, is because we're not in person. Now, I have to say, I think KI could not have done a better job in putting together a virtual meeting. They pulled out all the stops and did everything as well as you can. And I think the virtual meeting has a lot of upside in terms of getting questions answered and poster sessions. But at the end of the day, as one of my colleagues used to say, without that walking back and forth to the hotel, coffee breaks, meals, sitting next to someone and whispering in the auditorium during the talk, all those interactions that happen outside you know, that's really what's needed. You can't, you really can't build a community like this on virtual meetings. So that's one big thing. And hopefully that will be remedied next year. But then I was also looking at the structure of our meeting. And we had, for example, this event, Meet a Modeler. But I noticed we didn't have a, an event, Meet a Biologist. And then I thought, well, of course, because who would want to meet a biologist? It's like, nobody really needs that. But then I thought, and Elizabeth had the exact same thought, you know, maybe that's wrong. Maybe what we should do next time is have 10, 10 minute talks by biologists who have good projects, but no, comp no collaborator. So it's, I'm looking for a computational collaborator talk. So I think there are more things we can build into the meeting to make this more about everybody. I'm hoping that the website will help I'm hoping we will back, be back together in person next year, and that will help a lot. Um, another thing that came up actually in the NSF funding talk, it came up, uh, Eric brought it up first, and I think Belinda really strongly agreed with the idea that we needed to talk more about peer theory and the value of it. Um, and that was in the context of getting it funded by NSF, but I think we could bring that into our meeting and we could have uh, a session that's uh, devoted to pure theory. Um, bottom line is this meeting can be whatever this community wants it to be. So it's up to us to solve the problems and figure out the types of ways of meeting and communicating that will get past some of these um, stops that were, I mean, I, it was really struck by the questions. I mean, like at least half of them were about how do we communicate with each other? We sound like a, a dysfunctional family. Okay, that, that's my um, opening. And now I just wanna open it up to your guys' um, observations, questions, feedback, comments, anything. It's, it's yours. Take it away.
So um, I think that the idea of, uh, you know, having uh, people that have no modeling in their work is really interesting. Um, but I think not just, uh, I think it would be good if it, there was at least some common uh, interest from the modeling slash experiment person onto a common goal, you know, or something like that, because I think that that's really what brings us together. So for example, for me, I would love to talk with someone that, you know, has, I don't know anything about Arabidopsis, Arabidopsis, for example, but I know that they have many more genes than, you know, many other organisms or something. So I'd love to learn more about that and maybe see if some of the modeling we do would work. Uh, now, in terms of the big picture of the meeting, I think that what I would love to challenge everyone. So I came from physics, physical chemistry, condensed matter physics, and I used to think that it was easier to teach uh, a quantitative person, a quantitatively trained person biology, than to teach a biologist math, the math and the physics and the and all these things. And I think I've turned that around because I think that physicists and, uh, and mathematicians, uh, we're trained in such a very rigorous structured way that we bring a lot of biases and we're getting shedding those biases when you come to biology is very hard. And I'm, I think that, you know, other people might, might, I'd love to hear what people think. And what I would love to start thinking about is how do we, bridge this gap of, you know, language in terms of, you know, do we need to teach biologists linear, linear, uh, linear algebra, or do we need to teach people, uh, I mean, field theory, like they were talking about today, or is it enough to just teach the concept so that we can have a better community that actually, uh, you know, when, when, say, for example, Eric talks about his models, uh, you know, some experimentalists, uh, who was it, uh, Stephanie yesterday that gave the talk, um, so that that conversation can, can flow more, more, more easily. Uh, and I was really excited about the panels we had because I think that there were some 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 inklings of that there, but I felt like there was maybe a lack of of two way street in that communication. And I would love to to think about hey, how do we make this two this two way street a communication happen better? So Carlos, we had a, a workshop, a computational workshop built into this uh, meeting, and I was just curious whether people have found it useful. So um, whoever is listening to me. Could you respond to that? Did you attend it and was it useful? Is it something that we should continue or maybe expand? Um, any comments would be very welcome. You're talking about the um, concurrent session? The... Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, I went to that. I thought it was really great. I thought it was fabulous. And that was down to the presenters. Um, they did a great job. And I think we could definitely have more of that. So for example, the modelers talk all the time about various computational tools. Sometimes they're just names to us. We could have a session going through them and explaining them um, just a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, but again, this is, these are all, those are strategies to help the biologists. And I'm, what I'm interested in is a systems biology community. So Dave, no. I, have a, I have a thought, comment, suggestion, whatever for that. Um, so, you know, there are these, uh, I was talking to Elizabeth Reed, one of our breakout groups, right? She's part of this UC Irvine NSF Simon Center. That's, I had a wonderful time with that. Um, here in Chicago, Northwestern University has one um, that I've been doing a lot of different things with, had a pilot grant, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so when Dave was advertising, when you guys were advertising this conference, I certainly on my very low number of followers that I have on Twitter, I wrote something and I advertised for Dave and I tagged the NSF Simon Center here and they retweeted it as well. But that's as far as it went in terms of outreach to that community. Uh, and I'm not sure how effective it was. I don't think you know, it was very effective. Um, so I would just suggest that you know, uh, if you wanna grow the community and get a more diversity of sort of different types of modeling through biology involved, then working with the leadership of these different centers, there's several of them across the country, is a nice way to do that in advance and kind of getting them involved from the get go. Um, in particular, the NSF Simon Center here has a conference every year that I attend. It's a quantitative biology conference. I'm sure the other ones have those as well. So you could imagine trying to combine it in some way uh, those efforts. Just want to mention that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I would like to pick up on David's idea and ask if really uh, like the purpose of the 
talk can be structured ahead of time. And we may have session for biologists that don't have a model technique, uh, but they would like to, like they are looking for modeling advice and uh, maybe session for uh, computational biologist modelers that need uh, uh, advice on uh, or like collaborators for experimental verification of their ideas. So lighting talks now were kind of unstructured. They were about everything, just as a talks and regular workshop. And we can request uh, lighting talks to be specific of like, we need help, not we just tell what yeah. we can do, but uh, what we would like to do. Right. I, I, th I think we can do more, more of the biologists presenting in the hopes of attracting um, help from computational scientists so that computational scientists can be shopping around and the, the, these guys are on display. You know, I'm just very sensitive to this whole the suggestion that uh, we're here just to serve cell biologists. I've taken that to heart and I want to change it. Um, here's another suggestion a note handed to me by the production staff here. What about the idea of having a session where one or two biologists or three explain the basics of the most popular model systems? So we could go through Arabidopsis basics, zebrafish basics. Um, this, yeah, what do you guys think about? I mean, in other words, will the computational scientists appreciate that as any sort of help or yes. I do. yeah so I, 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 once confused, I once confused c elegans and drosophila i thought that the little worms were just the the, the baby uh, uh flies before they grew their wings and i would made an uh, an idiot of myself in a meeting so yes i would i would love this 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 uh i would love this knowledge <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I will. I will say that, but because a lot of people work on plants, and like aside from eating them, I know very little about them, and so <laughs> Eric, you don't I, eat plants. We know you don't eat. You don't. I eat do plants. sometimes, every once in a while. No, I like it. Like I anyway. So the point is that I think learning about plants would would be um, in the vernacular uh, completely balling, because it would just be like, you know, they have like the meristem and dealy who and the different cell walls and things and leaves and flowers. Anyway, I've got sexual to... parts. Let's let's get to it. Yeah. Well, the pollen hydration talk. I yeah. was like, let's has well did like, I mean, there's just so much cool stuff in the world of plants that 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 I pr this is just me being selfish because no, no, it's, I mean, I, this I, is what we're looking for. I, I knew that I know that worms and flies are different. But I don't know really any difference between like soybeans and Arabidopsis. And all I know is that everybody talks about Arabidopsis a lot. And but there are other plants too. Anyway, Some, I yeah. think about plants would be great. Yeah. So just so you guys know that there were at least half of all the project proposal, project presentation proposals were plants. I had to cut some of the plants because we had in the end three out of six. I think so, and I think that's probably largely due to Liz's effort and connections, but it's a good point. There's a lot of plant biology, but I think the general idea of explaining model systems, what they're used for, what are the tools, because every model system is chosen for specific strengths. So just like computational people choose particular computational tools for good reasons. So I, I would see this as a great concurrent session the biologists go off to learn about, here are the computational tools that you're hearing about all the time, this Markov this and Boolean that, this is what it means. And at the same time, the computational people maybe go and learn about plants and zebra fish and maybe even yeast. Mice. And then we actually meet physically to interact during the coffee hour and feel enlightened. I think well, should be your hour. Hmm? I think it should be a, a beer hour, not a coffee hour. Okay. Or wine or enems, I don't know. I but yeah, I think that, uh, uh, so what you're saying is uh, uh, kind of a, uh, a guide for, for, for the different model systems would be wonderful. And also a guide for the common 
modeling terms, right? Systems yeah. of equations and things like that. For people who don't know their Booleans from their Baileyan. <laughs> it's like, you know, you guys throw away these terms around expecting us to understand them. <laughs> I just say, say, I'll say this. Thank goodness for Google. What other suggestions or complaints or things you thought could be better? That That's things you didn't think were as good as they could have been. Anything. If so, I may say a little bit of a um, suggestion, if it's possible. For biologists, it's very difficult to get to know different fields of modeling and who are good at those individual different fields of the modeling and what kind of modeling would be most effective to particular phase of this research I'm doing, next phase, different questions, next phase, different questions, and may require different model art techniques. So it would be nice to have someone like a student advisor kind of a role of persons um, we can have here. So basically, you know, biologists go to that advisor. So I'm interested in something like this, my project, something like this. And the advisor can give names who should we go talk to. That to give us very quick ideas of, well, what, what kind of modeling field would be relevant to this particular research, you know, I'm in currently. Yeah, I think this has been a big theme that has emerged this week. Even in the project presentations, the expert panel often started with, why did you choose this approach? And frankly, I think in most cases, the biologists would answer that question by saying, because that's what the modeler said to do. So, <laughs> we, we really could use more, at least basic understanding of the different approaches and when to use them. So I'm writing this down in my mind. So it looks like we are going into teaching style workshop when uh, experimentalists will teach uh, computational people about different model systems in biology and computational people will teach uh, uh, biologists about different approaches. No, uh, talking about features within a larger workshop, just so there would be a concurrent session where we do these things. We're still interested in, you know, showing project presentations and getting collaborations going, bringing people together. This would just be one new feature, not the entirety of it. Mm -hmm. That's the way I'm thinking of it anyway. I think that would be a terrible workshop. The whole thing would be, we teach you, you teach us. It would be one session, I would say. That I mean, that's just, go ahead. Actually, I'm, I'm going to give a shout out to Carlos Lopez. Carlos, weren't, weren't we talking about something like that the other day? Remember yes. We uh, about uh, yeah, yeah, about what would be the... So um, Suzanne and I were thinking, what if I sit with you and talk about the basics of modeling so that you can understand modeling, and then we use that to turn it into a workshop? And that was our plan. And I would love to do that with you know a few people if you guys want, and we can talk about, you know, this is how we do modeling, or this is what optimization means, parameter inference, um, those kinds of things that like like uh, David said, we throw around just like you throw Drosophila around. And, uh, and you know, and uh, we, we, we begin to build this. <laughs> okay, so what I'm hearing is that Carlos and Suzanne are volunteering to organize FYIM5. Is that what you're saying? That's only only hey, if-, if uh, You need to get your ears cleaned out, dude. <laughs> 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 Take the cotton out of your ears. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll help. But maybe we could think about a session. If you're talking a session, maybe we could get that started with, what do you think, Carlos? I, I mean, I, I don't know anything about modeling, so you would have to be the lead on it, but I'd be help, happy to be your, um, your test case, because if I could understand it, then anybody can. Yeah, I would love yeah. that. And, uh, and, and in the same way, you know, I would love to 
like to get that that back like uh like uh, eric was saying i would love it if yoshi gives us a crash course on soybean pollen because i have no idea how that works <laughs> I, I think this is a great idea we could uh, arrange for a number of tutorials over the coming half year as as a developmental phase for the next meeting we'll call that our fyim pipeline and i would go to your thing too to, um carlos um i think i could be another test case and we could um, see if there are biologists, or really modelers who want to learn about a particular system on the biology side. Um, that sounds good. What else you got? Don't you guys have any criticisms or complaints? It was, if I could... it was, so, it was so perfect. There was, nothing. there was nothing. The food has been terrible. <laughs> yeah, the food has been bad. The sleeping accommodations are... Coffee, <laughs> the screaming toddlers when I'm trying to listen to the talks. The do people's dogs, Rob Phillips' yeah, dog. dogs. <laughs> Rob's dog. Get him out. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, we've got like what five more minutes. Uh, well, let's do the survey, Dave. Let's do the survey. Do you want to do that? Well, yeah, but I think that's up to Ki to release the survey. I don't have the survey. Uh, can we talk to them and ask them? Jonathan, yes. yes. Yep. We can Who drop it you? in the chat. Okay, so we're sending out a survey. We want you guys to take, should take only three to five minutes. Everyone at the meeting who registered for the meeting will get the survey and will be badgered and pestered until they complete it. So you might as well get this over with now. Jocelyn. I am here. I saved it in our agenda, but I don't. It's in the chat already. Oh, thanks. Okay, thanks. <laughs> so, hey, Malachi, maybe we could play a little music while people complete the survey for a few minutes. Any requests? Mm, something oh. light and airy, please. Oh, no more Mr. Nice Guy by Alice Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> or School's Out. School's I see. Out. So, okay. One of the things I would add, David, to what we're talking about in terms of this, this joint uh, things and uh, to, to encourage collaboration would be if there was some sort of, uh, like, I think it was... Um, uh, Elizabeth that said, uh, Elizabeth Reed, that said that it, there was some kind of angel funding associated with it. And I think we tried that, but, um, but I mean, you know, maybe, maybe, I mean, it takes, because in the end, it's not the PIs that are going to do the work. It's the students and the postdocs. And so funding someone to work on some project would be really useful, uh, even for a year. So, you know. Wait, I, you're saying through this grant funding? I don't know. I mean, you're the one with the connections to money. No, That's I know. I know what the answer is. I I went to NSF when it was clear we were going to be online. I said, you know, we've got fifty thousand dollars budgeted for flights and hotel. You know, because this meeting's free. You get to come to this meeting and stay in Chicago free. I said, with that fifty thousand, we could increase the budgets on these training and travel awards. You know, to maybe five k. That would be more meaningful. So they said no. They allowed me to double it from 1,000 to 2,000. But you know, they don't want me, you know, they don't want us handing out money without them having some oversight. I mean, it, right. So, and, and I'm not saying we hand out money, but maybe, for example, there's a mechanism where, you know, two people could put a small proposal that would, you know, have a very high chance of being funded to get. A collaboration going to to get it to get it seated you know like again you know going back to the example with eric and yoshi because because uh, it's the one that's in my mind um the only barrier that i would have to collaborating with someone new is that i would have to take someone away from one project and put them in another project uh, or take a new student and put it in a project or a new postdoc and and that's not yeah. that ship is not so easy to turn yeah I, d I think it's a good idea i just don't think we have we're not going to be able to make such awards that was the idea, though, was to bring people together, support them, and then they get an NSF grant. And Belinda realized that dream. She came, I think, to the first year and second year and a third year announced that she and her 
biologist collaborator who she met, I think at the meeting, yeah. were NSF funded. So. Linda shook, shook her head, is that not true? We didn't meet at the meeting. That was the part that wasn't true. All right, well, in my, but... my version you did. <laughs> um, you presented at the meeting, right? We presented, yes. Okay. So, so one one quick thing. Oh, Matthew unmuted, and Matthew has a lot to say. So maybe I shouldn't. No, I don't have that. I, I'd say, Carlos, if if you got together with somebody for a trial project, that's the kind of thing that eagers are are oh, really possible the, for. The, the mechanism eager. Well, that or if you're developing new tools, there's a DCL for tool development, um, mm -hmm. or um, and that could be computational tools as well. Are eagers reviewed in in, uh, in panels, or are they reviewed uh, internally? No, 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 no. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, so that would work, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that that's it would have to be original, yeah. So, it, it, yeah. And yeah, my only Here, comment sorry. about about that is that you know, so here the all the all the talks that were in the main thingy were were from people who are already working together. Right. So, so in terms of, I mean, the way that we were meant to meet potential new collaborators was kind of on the margins, right? Like to even the lightning talks that I went to, I didn't get to go to all of them, but the ones I went to were, were, were about projects that, that had a significant computational component already in them. So I think that the, 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 you know, the way that this meeting can kind of nucleate new collaborations, um, you know, would require uh, maybe more talks from either side, people with tools who need stuff to, to, to apply, like computational tools who are interested in meeting people who might be interested in, in, in working together, applying them to certain biological systems or vice versa, uh, might might be more, more effective at that. I don't know, that's just my two cents. Um, yeah, so that's the new idea, is to have us like that, exactly. <clears throat> The, the goal of stimulating collaborations was not exclusive to the meeting site, though. What we wanted to do was help people appreciate the potential value and go after it, whether on either side. And yeah, and go and ultimately use the matching website once that's done. Um, and I think that's been successful. The first year we, in our survey, we asked, how many started new collaborations at the meeting and how many were interested in doing so. <clears throat> it was a huge, huge majority had gone from, you know, very tepid interest to I'm very interested. Um, I'll throw out another interesting idea. Again, it kind of comes back to the, the money issue and the funding, but, um... One thing I've seen done here at my university is uh, specifically uh, giving tiny amounts of money to students, you know, like, you know, where there's actually a rule like this, this new collaboration has to be new and it has to be initiated and proposed by, by trainees. I shouldn't say students, by trainees, students or postdocs. Um, and that's also, I think, can be useful because it really puts, it really motivates um, the trainees who are attending the meeting to mm -hmm think about, you know, what do I want to propose and, you know, who are the people at this meeting that I want to talk to and, and, and um, so I think mechanisms like that are, are really interesting because they shake things up a little bit compared to the sort of the PI proposes the uh, collaboration model. So those I really like that idea and, and um, if I could just take off on that idea. Um, I don't know if there's anybody on this call who was part of kind of the precursor to this, which was a meeting that happened at Spelman um, probably six or seven years ago now that brought together modelers and biologists, um, specifically trying to form partnerships between majority institutions and historically black institutions. And, and I would love to see some leveraging of this meeting to prompt those kinds of collaborations as well. Um, what we learned in that in those that meeting was that there were there's a tremendous reservoir of talent at HBCUs on the computational side, but but very often there are constraints in terms of um, facilities for wet lab research, and so they're hungry to have these kinds of collaborations. I'd love to see us leverage those, this meeting to make those kinds of things happen, and that and NSF would bite on that. I think we probably can incorporate it into the next meetings for sure. 
Elizabeth um, Reed, I just want to say that the travel and training award, $2,000 awards are not exclusive to PIs. There's nothing in the rules that say the collaboration has to be coming from a PI. A graduate student can collaborate. I mean, presumably a PI will be on there. It doesn't have to be two PIs. It can be a graduate student in one lab and a PI in another group. That's fine. So maybe that goes a little towards what you were saying. Yeah, it does. Yeah. 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 I think it needs to be spelled out maybe a little bit more clearly with the emphasis on the on the trainees. That can be easily done. I mean it's just one model. It's not the only model, but yeah. it's yeah. it's a good model though. You should utilize it. Yeah. Frankly, I thought offering money would bring like a horde descending on us. It didn't really, but <laughs> I guess it's not a lot of money. Yeah, it's just, I mean, it's honestly, I think the prob that's the problem is that it's just not, it's as Carlos was sort of saying, I mean, you know, starting a new project that that's just, I mean, having a conversation in person, which is what that can kind of support maybe is a little travel. It's very nice, but but to really get something going, you know, you need to either get a new person on it or take someone off of something you already have funded. And, and, and that, that can be hard with only yeah. like two grand. You know, it's not meant to be the salary for a new postdoc. Um, but I think Elizabeth's right. You know, $2,000 to a PI is like nothing. But to a grad student, it's, it is something. It's also that really important thing about being validated. You know, I got money for this project. You know, people feel that is like some sort of validation, I think. Anyway, you're right. I should have asked you guys first. It was a waste of time. No, we'll see. Maybe we'll get applications for it. Maybe we won't. Um, so I think we're at the point. Has everybody turned in their um, survey? Donalyn, Jocelyn? We hope so. <laughs> okay. Because that would bring us on the times um, on your agenda. That brings us to, um, yeah, we're right there at the closing ceremonies. So there, I don't have a lot more to say. You're probably happy to hear that. Um, I do uh, wanna remind everyone that Michael has been working um, with Malachi, who's the guy in the truck to get the videos up on um, YouTube. And we have an FYIM YouTube channel now and it's being populated with all the presentations of this meeting with the exception of those who didn't want them to go up. So we were careful to make sure that um, we didn't uh, post anything someone didn't want. But over the next few days, we'll have finished that and you should be sure to share the, all you have to do is Google, uh, I mean, go to YouTube and do a search for finding your inner modeler and you'll find the site. Um, let me see. I have a list of also in the chat window. If you scroll up, you will see it. Uh, but regarding YouTube channel, I have a question to all participants. So we decided to post not just talks, but the whole sessions with uh, cutting out something that you request us to cut out. So it will be also introduction by KI people and all the lovely discussions that sometimes longer than the, the talk. So is everyone happy about it? Because another option would be to cut and leave just talks and maybe few questions. But uh, I think that the format of this workshop uh, suggests that we present to the world the whole discussions. So. I vote for that. People can scroll forward if they don't want to hear that part. Yeah, but please check if some of you feel uncomfortable about like your face is showing up for the whole YouTube screen. Don't worry to let us know and we will try to cut out these parts. So I put on YouTube channel some test uh, uh, videos, not all of them, but you can check already and see how they look like. You will see some of your faces in for the whole screen, or you may say that, wow, I'm so tired of some of them. I don't want to see anymore. So please don't hesitate to share your thoughts. Okay, three more quick comments. 
Um, I went to the Wonder Room a few times. No one was ever there. I'm going to go to the happy hour in the Wonder Room after this briefly. And if anybody wants to um, say, talk to me for any reason, I'll be there at least briefly until I realize no one else is there. Um, now I want to go to, I'm going to share my screen. I'm not going to forget to share my screen. And I want to put up, I showed this before, the thanks to our keynote speakers, our workshop leaders, a big thank you to the invited computational experts. You guys did a really great job, I think, in the project presentations you shined. All of the presenters um, and NSF, of course, um, and thank you, Matthew, for attending every single session. Um, that's really admirable. And um, I guess that's what they make you do when you're working for NSF. And then finally, a really big thanks to the good people at KI, Donalyn, Jocelyn, and the guy in the truck, Malachi. You guys are just really great. And I looked on my calendar this morning and our, our first week meeting was in early October last year. We met with these guys every two weeks through December and then every month for a while and then back to every week. And so I feel a little bit like Dorothy at the very end when she's leaving Oz and she has to say goodbye. And I'm, I'm not gonna you know, single out any one of these as, as the scarecrow. They're all the scarecrow. Um, but yeah, I, I look forward to working with you guys again. It makes it all tolerable. And with that, I will just announce that um, we have decided on the site for next year, um, next year's FYIM, which we hope will be in person. There was a little power struggle between Birmingham and Chicago, Chicago one. And I'm just gonna take you to the site right now. And that's where we'll be a year from now. That's my office on the front, on the fourth floor. The lot is empty because the university has given this entire building to me. So one of these cars is mine and the rest are people in my lab. Um, but anyway, we're going to be here next, probably beginning of August. We'll see about the timing. It would be similar to this year. And I hope to see all of you guys in person. Um, any of you computational invited experts, I'm not going to bug you to do this again because it's a great service to the community. But if you want to do it again and volunteer, I would be glad to have you back. Eric said he wants to do it for sure. <laughs> Thank yeah, you, Carlos. Carlos, Carlos. 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 Like Carlos volunteering. Yeah, I think, I, think, I think I've heard from 17 different people that this is what makes Carlos you know, happy is to be the expert modeler, so. <laughs> no, I, I, I think it was, I actually really enjoyed this, so. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Can we also uh, give a, a big thank you to Dave for being a tremendous oh, right. MC? I was going to say, KI has a few closing comments, too. Right, I'm going to stop my screen share then. So thank you for that, Andrew, because we did want to say thank you to Dave and we wanted to say thank you to all of you for coming. And we have developed something in KI that we kind of like to do at the end of an event. So let's see if I can get this to work. We have what we like to call the Zoomy Awards. So we started this <laughs> After the Emmys or the Grammys, I can't even remember which one it was anymore. So kind of things that we like along the way. Um, so welcome to the Zoomies. First, we have the best beard in town, Eric. Well done for always showing up and showing us the beard. It was great. It's part of me. I can't not it's either <laughs> shave it off or show up with it. Show up with it, my friend. Show up. Um, 
We loved Elizabeth's presentation. It really kind of wowed us with all of G imaging and it worked and it was awesome. So we, and I should tell you that this is the three of us behind the scenes making all of this up. So we have no idea, Elizabeth, about your content, but man, we really enjoyed the presentation. Um, how could we not shout out this lab picture? This was fantastic. However, it was a really good runner up. We just couldn't screen grab it in time. The animation on this one and that kind of uh, the Brady Bunch, it was really, really cool. So all the little pieces of flavor are awesome. We had a few pet cameos. We couldn't catch them and you should have seen us trying to catch this pet cameo. This is the only one where you see her dog's face instead of the other end. So apologies for it being blurry but we did have our best cameo. We were watching out for babies and spouses, but we couldn't catch any. Um, oh, and then Dave, thank you for letting this be your Kai Storm profile picture. I remember when he sent it to us and we were like, is he joking or is he serious? Should we really post this on Kai Storm? And so we asked and we said, are, are you serious? Do you really want us to post this for your profile picture? And he said, yeah, yes, but only if you can do all three. So Dave, I'm not, I don't think this is actually present day for you. And it would have been really cool if you'd worn that shirt. Um, but we wanted to end with a big thanks to you and all of the planning and your help. Um, so thank you to everyone. Um, Kai Storm will not go away. Um, it will stay open until you don't want it to be open. We will make sure that we send out the survey links to everyone. And thank you very much for all of your participation as well. I want to add one thing. Young Dave looks like Tony Hawk. Just saying. No, I think I think he looks like Tom Petty. That was my feeling. Young Tom Petty, you're right. If it's Tom she's... Petty and Tony Hawk had a baby. Yeah. It was exactly. Just... It was David. <laughs> I just want to say, you guys, I'm at the just leave me alone stage of my career. Where you've sort of dragged me back to life, A. And B, thank you for putting up the three pictures. You should see all the ideas they shot down, though, <laughs> that they wouldn't let me do. But there, that was probably for the best. <laughs> there were a few. There were a few. <laughs> oh, my. Um, so thank you, everyone. Hello. Hopefully you will join Dave in the Wonder Room for final goodbyes. Um, we have loved having you all and hope that we'll see you in Chicago next year. Thank uh, you. All. Have a great weekend. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.